Hey everybody, and welcome again to another commission painting blog. This is number eight, nine, ten. I can't recall. I should have looked that up. Anyway, uh, today uh, I'm going to start out by looking at some of this month's projects, uh, and then I'm going to do a couple little mini reviews, and we'll see what else we get up to. So uh, one of the bigger projects I've done this month were three starter armies for Drop Zone Commander. And it seems like every time I do a Drop Zone Commander project, I have a new favorite army. Uh, when I first got into Drop Zone Commander myself, or at least when I first attempted to, uh, I picked up, oh, and I can't even remember what they're called now, um, but one of the alien races. And when I actually started playing, I did UCM, and now my favorite is the Post-Human Republic. Although I have to say, the first time I painted Post-Human Republic uh, minis, they were my favorite then, too. Um, they're all good. All of their armies are really cool, and I like them all, so it's kind of fun. Uh, but really like how these came out. The All of the color schemes were suggested by the client, and uh, I... I think I have pictures floating around here somewhere. Um, but overall, uh, that, that took up a good chunk of the month so far. The kind of odd thing about this month is I actually have a couple of non-gaming projects that I've been working on. The first being uh, like a little logo dude. Uh, I'll be hopefully finishing him up today. Uh, he's 3D printed through um, Shapeways. So I had to do a fair amount of uh, sanding and priming to get him to a state where he was nice and clean. There's still a couple of undercut areas where he has a little bit of his original texture, but overall, I think he came out nice, nice and smooth and cool looking. So I think you can see that. So that's one thing. And the other thing that is non-game related is this saber-tooth cat. And yesterday I did a little work on his back to add in some fur texture that appeared to have gotten lost. It kind of looked like somebody had sanded on this a little bit and the fur texture went away. So I just wanted to add that back in. And I had to pin in his teeth which appear, well, that's going to need a little glue. What I ended up doing was I did the pins, and since the pins didn't, the, the teeth didn't sit flush to the mouth, I added a little bit of green stuff underneath them and then put them in, but I hadn't glued them yet. So now I'm going to glue them down to make that permanent, and then, you know, we might be able to get started on him today. But I'm kind of looking forward to it because I haven't done a large non-gaming resin model in many years. Uh, and this is something that I used to do quite a bit just on my own. Uh, it was my, my other hobby aside from uh, gaming miniatures. So this should be pretty cool. And there's going to be a lot of airbrush work on this. So the other thing uh, that I have to work on this month is... the Leviathan Mortis from Dreamforge Games. And this is a big Titan-like model that I actually got started on early in the month because I was really kind of excited to see how it was going to go together. So I have the, uh, the leg subassembly completed. And you can see all of the articulation that is going on in this thing and it'll rotate there it'll rotate here and here and when it's done it's going to be massive um, but i've also got a number of weapons for it and like this is the beowulf slash grendel and the difference is uh One of them is a short barrel. It's like a gun size. And the other is 
is, if I can get it in there. Oh, it goes that way. The other is a long barrel. Look at it, it's just massive. Um, but this one also needed, this one can be either left or right handed and it has a, uh, uh, an ammunition hopper, but it needs to be able to be switched to either side, depending on whether you have it on your right or left arm. Yeah, that's magnetized. Just a couple of small magnets on either side to hold it in place. Um, so there's still a fair bit of the building part of that project to do. Um, I, I've assembled all of the extra weapons, but I haven't actually done any of the standard weapons that come with it. Um, so I don't know how long that's going to take to get that completed. I also have a handful of fantasy minis that I have to do quite right at the end of the month, but there's still a lot of work left to do this month. So I was considering doing a full review of this, but I don't know that it necessarily um, requires it. So I'm just gonna do a little mini review. This is the flip-in head magnifier, which is essentially kind of a Chinese copy of the magnifier that I've been using since about 2006, uh, which is the Optivisor. Now the Optivisor has been around forever. In fact, we sold these at the very first hobby store that I worked at uh, in the mid 1980s. And they were exactly the same. Uh, they do have different models, but their base model is essentially just the magnifier lens on a plastic headband. And it was fantastic. This thing actually really changed my life in terms of painting because I picked it up at a time when I was having difficulty seeing the models, but I couldn't quite figure out what the problem was. It was, and at the time I felt like I just wasn't getting enough light on the subject. It's really weird how your brain can kind of fool you. Uh, and then I bought these on a whim, took them home and immediately was able to see, oh, I just can't see very well anymore. Because of course, I'm getting old. Uh, so I've been using them for a long time. In fact, I recently replaced the, the lens, which, you know, when you're replacing the lens, it's about 30%, uh, I'm sorry, 60% of the cost. Actually, it's even more than that. It's almost two thirds the cost of the entire uh, magnifier. So, and I've, I've kind of been wanting to have a second, more powerful uh, lens to go with it. But because it's so expensive, I've never gotten around to doing that. And so when I saw these, uh, I decided to give them a try because the standard lens is about the same magnification as the Optivisor. But it comes with another set that you just flip down and then you kind of have double the amount. And on top of that, you can flip down the little loop and just get crazy amounts of magnification. Uh, the problem is, while the Optivisor appears to be a, uh, a very well designed uh, magnifier by people who do optics for a living, this is a Chinese reproduction of that. and so the optics feel a little bit more like um, a really nicely polished plastic magnifying glass, you know, like you might buy for a kid. Not quite so bad, but you know what I'm saying. Uh, there's a difference between, a, you know, a finely, finely uh, crafted piece of optics and one not so much and this is on the not so much side. But on the plus side, it's not so bad that you can't go ahead and use it all day. I've used this uh, magnifier every day for the past couple of weeks, and I wear this pretty much all day, and I use at least the base lens uh, most of the time when I'm painting, which means that I've looked for hours through this thing, and it works okay. I feel like I, I don't have as much play in terms of distance 
uh, that I can have it the subject away from me and have it be in focus um, actually I, maybe I'm I might be misremembering that oh that's certainly true when you bring the secondary one down but in any, in any case having that secondary lens available at any moment is super nice um, I, the reason I've been wanting a stronger lens is because I feel like uh, when I'm painting eyes, for example, I really want to be able to get in tight and see what I'm doing. And this actually really provides that. And so it's even though the optics aren't quite as nice as I might like, it's still useful and it still gets the job done. Uh, the loop is kind of overkill. Um, you only get one eye out of it. And this one really does feel like a uh, toy magnifying glass. So uh, that doesn't get much use and may eventually get taken off the thing altogether because uh, the other difference between this one and the Optivisor is that this is heavy. Um, not so heavy that it's bothersome, but you can tell. Uh, especially because one of the other features I haven't even mentioned yet is that there's a light on the top, um, which seemed like I wouldn't necessarily need it, but I have actually used it now because every now and then I get into a spot where I need to see inside of something and you know the the lamps that I have around me aren't really covering that area and I can just hit this and if I need to angle it down I can do that if I need to angle it uh, left and right I can do that and that's kind of sweet but it means there's also a battery in there which adds a little bit more weight and this seems to be, uh, you know, a little bit heavier duty plastic. So that adds some weight. So overall it's, it's heavier. On the other hand, it feels better constructed. So one of the complaints I have about the Optivisor is that the lens is held in place with these two plastic, uh, I don't know, I want to call them push pins, but they're just, they just snap into place. And for, to be fair, for most of the life of this visor, that's been fine. But over the years, the, uh, either the, the uh, pins have worn, um, but really actually I think it's the visor itself has worn to the point where uh, it's not really holding it in as tightly as it should. And so the lens will occasionally pop out if I'm, I don't know if I pull it off wrong or if I toss it down a little bit too hard or whatever. Maybe it's just me. Maybe I'm just not taking care of it well enough. But uh, but it just feels like it's it could be made better. On the other hand, this is this is all screwed in. You've got nice machine screws holding the uh, the lens in. Nice machine screws holding the second lens in. There's a really nicely uh, spring-loaded uh, hinge there for bringing the secondary uh, lens out of the way when you're done with it. It's got nice metal uh, screws or knobs actually on either side, whereas the Optivisor is all plastic. Um, and so I don't know, it feels better made, except for the headband. The headband was super sharp right here. And so when I had it on, and if I had any eyebrow movement at all, it would cut into my skin, which was really annoying. So I just took a little 220 sandpaper and sanded down that edge, and now it's fine. But when I first got it, it was like, ow, ow, I'm not gonna wanna wear this, this sucks. And I still like the uh, more narrow uh, Optivisor band. So I'm tempted to sort of take the parts off of the Optivisor that I like and put them onto this one. But really, that really I think that only amounts to the band. So the Optivisor runs between like $30 and $40. Uh, this is $8 on Amazon. So even if the optics aren't as nice as they might be, they do seem to be good enough. And so if you've been thinking you've been wanting to get a magnifier to try out, 
I highly recommend getting this. Um, there is a link in the description that'll take you right to the item and eight bucks plus shipping, I imagine, unless you're on Prime. Uh, and although I don't know if this one's on Prime, but it's eight dollars. So, you know, add some other things to your order and you can get free shipping anyway. Uh, so yeah, that's it for the flip down magnet head magnifier. So something else I picked up this month uh, was a set of racks for my paints. I actually got two of these. And the thing is, I had acquired so many watercolors paints in such a short period of time that I now had tons of these tall bottles when you combine them with my uh, Vallejos that I really needed a good place to put them because tall bottles like to fall over. Uh, not only that, I really wanted to have a, a, something that would allow me to uh, have them closer to hand. But anyway, I looked around uh, at a number of different places that make these. You can find them all over the place. But I ended, I settled with uh, Gamecraft Minis. Gamecraft is uh, a company in California, and uh, I know the owner. We actually go back to my very first hobby store that I worked at, and where. He was a customer and I was a customer. We both had the same motorcycle and I don't know, weird things like that. <laughs> In any case, uh, we've been friends all this time and I thought, why not throw some business his way? And I've been happy that I did because these are beautiful. Uh, they assemble in about 20 minutes and uh, they're reasonably priced. Plus, he makes them for a number of different sizes, not just uh, like Citadel and Vallejo size bottles, but he also does them for Tamiya and Testers and some other brands as well. He's also open to doing, you know, easily customizable stuff. So if you're like, well, I need something that fits this, you can just let him know and he can do it for you. He also does a lot of uh, terrain pieces and what have you. So have a look. He's got some really nice stuff. So on the gaming side of things, uh, my son and I have actually gotten in a couple of games of Halo Fleet Battles. You might have noticed that I did a video of uh, painting the Covenant Heavy Cruiser. Well, the reason I've been painting the minis is because we've actually been playing and we kind of like it. Now, again, we're, we're only a couple of games in, so it's really hard to say uh, what our final, final feelings about it, especially since during our first game, we were really unsure whether or not it was going to be something that we really enjoyed. But the second game, uh, I think we both understood the rules a bit better and understood some of the uh, strategies a bit better. And in our second game, we used everything that came in the box set, uh, which turns out is, you know, while it's a good size game, you can definitely see scaling up from there, even though, I mean, there's a ton of minis, there's 49 minis in there. But the thing that's a, a little deceptive about that is that although there might be 49 ship minis in the box, that doesn't mean that you have 49 individual ships out on the table because for the most part, they're gonna be gr grouped in groups of two or three on a base. So on each side, you might have um, 10 or so bases. And so normally that would be like a base would be a ship, but in this case they call them elements and you have the groups. In any case, there's a lot of dice rolling. Uh, you know, it's in a, in a way is kind of a buckets of dice game. Uh, and I think in our first game, we had a hard time sort of feeling where the subtlety was in the game because it, it seemed like you just wanted to alpha strike everything. And to a certain extent, it's still kind of true, but I think uh, a lot of the strategy comes from maneuvering and getting, you know, optimal ranges for the weapons that you have and for the way the elements want to behave. And we really got to see how some of the special rules for things like Mac cannons and stuff work. Um, and, oh, and boarding parties. Like in our first game, I don't think we ever got a boarding party to do much of anything. And in the second game, we got to see how um, they can really turn the tide in a battle and how that might be the best way to deal with deal with um, destroying some of the larger ships. But yeah, we've had a good time with that and we're looking forward to doing some more games of it. 
on top of that, uh, my friend John and I have been doing a lot of Song of Blades and Heroes recently, which is a fantasy skirmish game, which uh, I know I've talked about in the vlog in the past, but we're now a few, three or four games in, I think, and we're it's so much fun. There's just something really compelling about that game. Part of it is that it really is not a competitive game. It's a game that you want to get together with friends and just have fun with, you know, almost like playing a role-playing game. Uh, which is not to say there isn't a winner or loser, but uh, when we were playing the game, it really felt like uh, you were just enjoying the wacky things that would happen during the game. And I don't, I don't mean that in a bad way, but just like, uh, for example, in our last game we had... Um, my undead warband versus his um, mostly human warband, but there was also a halfling in the group. And uh, uh, I had a, a terror causing wraith that in our previous game had caused all kinds of trouble as all of his warband would flee in terror. But in this game, the halfling managed to uh, stand up to the the wraith, who is actually my leader in this game, and then killed him, killed the wraith all on his own while, while everybody else stood by in terror. So that was super fun, and I was totally rooting for the halfling, and uh, uh, I still managed to pull a win out of that game, but it was, it was just hilarious. It was really hilarious to have just this little guy who's like, no, I'm not going to run away, and then he managed to kill the wraith. So... Anyway, those are the kinds of stories that I like to be able to tell when I'm done with my game. And uh, the Song of Blades and Heroes really seems to lend itself to that. So we started collecting some of the expansions for it and some of the alternate games. And so I think I have like four different rule sets that use that same rule set now. Although Song of Blades and Heroes is the original. But I've been having a lot of fun with it and you should definitely check it out. Uh, by the way, it links in the description. Check out the description for any of the things that I'm talking about here today, and I will uh, be able to send you off out to find them. So that's going to wrap it up for today's video. Um, I do have something... I have some plans for more creative videos in the future, and if you wait around to the very end of this video, you might get a hint of what I'm talking about. But... Uh, I don't know when I'm going to be able to get to that, and I'm still experimenting, but if you're kind of curious, stick around. Uh, but I just want to thank all of our Patreon subscribers. Uh, you guys rock. I really appreciate it. Uh, it really helps motivate me to continue to do videos and to think about ways to make the videos more interesting and to just up my game in general. So uh, every dollar helps, and you know all the support helps. So... Thank you again to Patreon subscribers. For everybody, if you liked this video, please click like on the video. And if you want to see more videos in the future, please subscribe. And if you really want to support the videos, there's a link to Patreon in the description. And, you know, again, every bit helps. So whatever you can do. I tend to charge for about four videos a month but you can cap your donation wherever you want. So uh, don't worry about getting weirdly overcharged. You have full control over that. But that's going to end it for today. And I'll talk to you next time. Bye. Hello? Hello? Is this thing on? Am I on? What's going on? Hello?